Yeah. That will so be fine you, also. Uh, so and then you can upload it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 You have all your slides yeah. and everything you need? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm pretty much yeah. ready, ready to go. The presentation is on my laptop. And I can okay. share screen anytime. You know, right. I, I assume that Katerina, you will do a little introduction. I'm ready. <laughs> oh my God. I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. 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 So, yeah. So now we just wait. Yeah, no, no worries. And I'm glad that uh, Hannah does not uh, appear okay. to be as bad uh, as uh, the media would have it. Hi, Doria. I want to get in the mask and get in the mask. Oh, um, yeah. You may you may want to test yeah. the audio on your computer. You know, I have uh, it set up so that the people are muted It's already set up that way. Yeah, and, uh, and so you, you can unmute, which is the button at the bottom left-hand side. Yeah, but it shows that everybody's already muted on the screen. Yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah, that's right. Okay, so we want, do we want it so they're unable to unmute? Yeah, that's right. Okay, so we want to unmute them. Okay, so we want to unmute them. Yeah, we want to unmute them. Yeah, we want to unmute them. Yeah, we want to unmute them. Well, they should be able to unmute themselves, of course, if they want to say something. But what I wanted was to make sure we avoid the situation where somebody has a blender in the background. Right, right. Okay, well, if anybody turns it on, we'll put it in mute. But right now, they are supposedly muted upon entry. Okay. Well, okay. Okay, sounds good. All right. Well, we'll go uh, on. Yeah, no, no, no worries. We, we are doing well. I mean, of course, with these online meetings, we are not giving the uh, Akademaiko Tetarto, as we say in Greek, but it might be the Akademaiko five minutes. So this is uh, Natalia for you. Yeah. In uh, universities in Greece, when a lecture is supposed to start uh, on top of the hour, it always starts 15 minutes late. And that is called the academic quarter, Akademaiko <laughs> Tetarto. And so we have a tradition when we do these presentations on site at the Hellenic Professional Society to give those 15 minutes and start 15 past the hour. But if we are online, okay. we cannot really do that. Okay. So okay. the idea will be to start on time, but then I was saying maybe okay. we give the academic five okay. minutes or something. Oh, so yes. Yes. Of course. Yeah, I will do it. Yeah, I'm doing Zoom every day. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yes, actually of all the platforms, I think it is yeah, the one that works the best. I've tried various internet. from Skype to Webex to Microsoft yeah. Teams. Right, so right. And, uh, and this one, yeah. I'm quite happy with no, it. Yeah. Except yeah. That, uh, that my record good record friend yeah. Manos no. called me yesterday yeah. to remind yeah. me of his Chinese technology. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, in my case, a lot depends on the client. Okay. There are some clients that use uh, Zoom, others that prefer uh, okay. um, Skype or WebEx. Mm -hmm. And there is one that actually does Microsoft Teams, but I think about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. it seems, yeah, it seems hey, like there's always something in different. In By in the way, have, have, have you heard of this Amazon Prime video called My Greek Odyssey? Absolutely nice. I love it. Oh, okay. I, I, need, to, I need to look at it. Uh, it's a, it's a, a Greek Australian whose parents immigrated to Australia and he made a lot of money and now he's traveling around every Greek island in his boat. Oh my God, this is wonderful. This is what my sister does. She takes about a couple of months every summer on a sailboat and they go to the most unusual little islands. Especially the what we call the Vrachon Is it the Vrachon These are the smallest of the Greek islands. They're uninhabited and they're usually very Christian. 
Oh, hi, George. George and others, I see there. Lots of paramanos. <laughs> good, good. Good, uh, good to see you, Julieta. Hello. <laughs> uh. Είμαστε live στο Facebook και, στα, και στο, και στο YouTube. YouTube. Αρχίσαμε τώρα, έτσι. Ωραία, μπράβο. Έγινε. Ωραία, Ηλία, μπράβο. Καλό, καλό θα, κάνω, ναι, θα κάνω mute για να μην ακούγεται τίποτε και θα Βεβαίως. ακούω εσάς. Έγινε. Βεβαίως. Okay. Καλή επιτυχία να έχουμε. Ευχαριστούμε. Είναι σε τρία και στο YouTube. Ευχαριστώ, ευχαριστώ πολύ. Υπέροχα. So we are checking on a couple of things for the next few minutes and uh, hopefully we'll get started without uh, much of a delay. So, Alex, I'd like to ask you, where are you now? <laughs> so good, this is uh, Cuernavaca. Uh, so, Cuernavaca is, uh, of course, a city in central Mexico. It's about an hour and a half drive south of Mexico City. It has very nice um, spring-like weather all year round. The temperature that we have here is, is in the 70s. And, uh, and it's like that every day, except that now is the rainy season, which means that it rains at night. During the day, it's usually quite nice, but when the evening comes around 8 or 9 or 10, you begin to have the thunderstorms, sort of the tropical rainstorms that, that come by. It's, uh, I've been here for quite a while, of course, with the situation with the pandemic. I cannot really travel, I mean, unless it is an absolute necessity, but it would be extremely irresponsible and dangerous to try to get on a plane and go to Greece or to Houston. So, so here I am. Um, I thought that Cuernavaca would be a good place to weather the pandemic because of the warmer climate all year round. But of course, this is not, it turned out to not be a flu-like infection, but, uh, but more cardiovascular in nature. So as a result, here I am. It's nice. I mean, I enjoy being here. And uh, Well, thanks very much. It's nearly two o'clock, so I'll just un I'll mute now. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I think that uh, we are expecting to make sure that Tina has made her has made it to her office location. She was supposed to be a couple of minutes away, a few minutes away, and so as uh, soon as she's there, since she will be take care of the recording and uh, sort of muting and muting aspect, we should be uh, able to get going. I see here various people have uh, have joined us already. Uh, hello, everyone. Hi, uh, uh, Rodrigo, Costa, Maria, and Yanni. Kalispera. Kalispera. Mm Δείχνουμε όλα τα άτομα πώ είναι το screen τώρα ή θα είναι ένα μεγάλο screen μόνο αν εσύ που θα μιλήσει. So, uh, as soon as, uh, as, we, as we get started, at first there will be a big screen with only Katerina and then she will pass it on to me. You will see me for a minute or so in a big screen and then hopefully it will be a big screen with the PowerPoint slides that accompany the presentation and likely I will be on a window on the side. Okay. Hopefully, that, that's normally the way it works. And I'm uh, just realizing that uh, Tina has just uh, 
made it to her at her office. Hi, Tina. I'm here. <laughs> I've been watching. I'm muting so, everybody as they come on. Okay. Okay. So it is now uh, two o'clock. And so we seem to have a number of people who have joined. So would you like to wait a couple of more minutes or let's get uh, going perhaps? Let's do English time. Give two minutes, Alex. Okay, so we'll give, we'll give two minutes for uh, more people to join. So, hello to those who joined, uh, uh, John, uh, Thanos, Lydia, and Costas. So, we are just waiting um, uh, a couple of more minutes and then we'll, we'll get started. Don't worry. Hi, Alexandria Dimitris. How are you? Hi, hi, Katerina. Hi, Dimitri, Katerina. Everything okay? You're Mexico, yep. in Mexico, eh? Yeah, in Cuernavaca, Morelos, I'm exactly. About an hour and a half background. drive south of Mexico City. I'm admiring your background, which is real. It's not... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. I try to make, uh, you know, to create the appropriate uh, environment, of course. Uh, You're in Cuernavaca? Yeah. How wonderful. The city yeah, of yeah. Spring, eternal spring. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, we have very nice... It's very nice climate. That's the one thing that I really enjoy here. Are you uh, living there? Uh, I spent part of the year here, and now, of course, I'm here as a result of the pandemic. I cannot really travel, as I was explaining to Georgia elsewhere. Oh. So, so I'm uh, I'm here until further notice, but this is my place oh, here wonderful. in Cuernavaca. I, I know a couple of people living there. Oh, good. Yes. Maybe, yeah. maybe yeah. we can hook up uh, afterwards. It's, yes, I'll tell you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it has been a, a, a hub of expats over the years, a little bit less now than it used to be a couple of decades ago. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that we can uh, probably get started, perhaps. So... Um I just want to um, uh, tell everyone that we'll be recording um, the presentation. Um, Tina, you can start recording when you're ready and tell us so we can start. I'll give a brief introduction before um, Alex's uh, presentation. Okay, we're already on. Uh, I just hit the record button a few minutes ago. Okay. 30 seconds ago. So we're ready. Good afternoon. Um, dear members and friends of the Hellenic Professional Society of Texas, I'm Katerina Kurenzi, and on behalf of the board of our society, I would like you to welcome you to today's presentation. Dr. Colamaridis is a long-standing friend, supporter, and past president of HPST. As uh, most of you already know, Alex is the creator and organizer of our annual HPST Poetry Nights for the past several years. Today, Alex is taking on a different and unique challenge to give us a glimpse into the world of genealogy and his own personal adventures to investigate his own family history. So without further ado, I turn over the virtual podium to Dr. Colamaridis. The title of his presentation is My Adventures in Genealogy Land. Alex. Ah, thank you. Thank you very much, Katerina. Can, can you see me? Let's see. Okay, good. Uh, if you can see me on the screen, you will see that uh, behind me there is, uh, among other things, a statue of Apollo, who is, of course, the symbol of the Hellenic Professional Society of Texas, as many of you may remember. And uh, can we go to full is, screen, uh, please? Can you see? 
Um, yes. We see everybody. I'd like to have a full screen, only you, if possible. Okay. Uh, can... Let me see how we can do that. Uh, um, you can do this. You can choose the speaker view. Okay. Yeah. I tried the speaker view myself. Uh, maybe we'll... It's in the upper right corner. Right. Or left, if you have an iPad. So we. So the idea is that whoever is the speaker should appear now. You can also uh, pin Alex when he speaks. Okay. Oh. Which okay. is what I try to do for, okay. with everybody. You you yeah. go okay. to the How upper right hand you, corner uh, and pin. Yeah. I see. Got it. Okay. Good. I pinned myself. So now you probably can see me. Yes. Right? Okay, good. Yes, so uh, behind me, you will see the statue of Apollo, uh, who is, of course, the symbol of our society. And there is a symbolism in that because Apollo, as you know, stands for logic, rationality, and light. And that, of course, will be the purpose as we look into genealogy, how to shed light into family history. The presentation will consist of two parts. At first, in pure Apollonian sense, we will uh, go into a little bit of the biology and mathematics of genealogy, just enough to give you uh, sort of the tools that are needed. And then we will spend most of the time uh, applying this, these ideas into my own family history. So, without further ado, let me share the screen and uh, we get going. So... Um, research into the lives of one's ancestors has been one of humanity's undertakings since time immemorial. It was oftentimes part of ancestor worship, an early form of religion that is still practiced in parts of Asia, Africa, and the Americas, and which came down to us in Greece as veneration of the dead since Homeric times. My focus here will be on biological ancestors, the ones with whom we demonstrably share blood, as we say in Greece. These may sometimes be distinct from our cultural or historical ancestors. Genealogy, as the venture of ancestor research is called today, has led to remarkable insights and compilations, such as Jesus's pedigree, allegedly leading all the way back a thousand years to Israel's King David, and another five years, 500 years back to Abraham, the Mormon genealogical research of their ancestors so as to afford them post-mortem salvation through their restored church, and the remarkable records of Scottish clans with their coats of arms. In our busy lives, genealogy is often overlooked or forgotten as one focuses on day-to-day -day chores and the immediate living family. Busy lives, however, especially in urbanized settings and in the quest for upward mobility in America, lead to a sense of rootlessness and alienation, to a vacuum of a soul that yearns to be filled with a narrative. The large-scale narratives provided by history or religion at the group or state level can be lacking at the individual level because they are missing, by necessity, the family history element. The family history element is often substituted by myths and made up stories with little, if any, basis in truth, aiming to aggrandize or create a heroic perception to fulfill the needs of our souls. I came across such stories myself when researching my own family history. Genealogy is a bit different because it aims to build a foundation of true family history based on fact and reasonable fact-based conjecture or deduction. It is the application of the scientific method, as it were, to family history in an effort to firmly establish it within its biological, social, cultural, and broader historical contexts. The study of genealogy has two distinct yet related sides. One 
is the identification of one's ancestors back in time on a genealogical tree and the detailing of those lives. The other is the exploration of all the other descendants of those ancestors, the distant relatives alive today. Genetics is the basis for both of those avenues of exploration. The human genome, our DNA, present in each of our cells, is a microscopic encyclopedia that consists of 3.1 billion base pairs. These are letters in the four-letter alphabet of nature. About 20 million of those base pairs, on average, 0.6% of the total, are different between any two unrelated individuals, and they form the basis for the observed human variation and for tracing human ancestry into various geographical regions. The 3.1 billion base pairs are arranged into 23 chromosomes, the volumes of the encyclopedia. Each of our cells contains 23 pairs of chromosomes, one set of 23 chromosomes from our father and the other set from our mother. There are two caveats. The first one is that one pair of chromosomes is the gender defining pair, which has the form XY, as you can see on the bottom uh, right hand side for men, X inherited from the mother and Y from the father, and XX for women, X inherited from the mother and X from the father. The Y chromosome is much shorter than the X chromosome which leads to slightly to slightly greater, about 2% maternal DNA length contribution for men. For women, of course, it is exactly 50-50 from the father and the mother. Notice, however, that the Y chromosome, which is present only in men, is inherited entirely from the father. The second caveat, our cells contain an additional minuscule DNA molecule at each of their energy producing centers, the mitochondria. This non-chromosomal DNA is the so-called mitochondrial DNA. It consists of 16,569 base pairs. Therefore, it's almost 200,000 times smaller than the nuclear or chromosomal DNA. It encodes 13 proteins and is only inherited from the mother. So there are the caveats. There is the Y chromosome from the father, the mitochondrial DNA from the mother. When we provide our sperm or egg cells to our children, each of the sperm or egg cells has the number of chromosomes reduced from 23 pairs to 23 single chromosomes, 22 plus an X or a Y, as a result of a process called meiosis, meiosis, from the Greek word for reduction. Each of these new single chromosomes consists of a mix of random chunks of DNA from the original paternal and maternal chromosomes that make up the, the corresponding chromosome pair. In essence, these random DNA chunks are what determines the amount of genetic material that our child inherits from each of its four grandparents. These chunks form the basis for genealogy. The average size of the inherited DNA chunks depends on chromosome region. It also varies between men's sperms and women's ova. The measure of DNA chunk size is a Senti Morgan named in honor of American geneticist Thomas Hunt Morgan. A Senti Morgan, an important metric in genealogical studies, is the number of DNA base pairs at a particular chromosome region for which the expectation of a crossover to the next chunk of inherited DNA is 0 0.01, hence the centi or 100th part. A man's sperm contains roughly 11,000 chunks of paternal and maternal inherited DNA, about 2,800 centimorgans, while a woman's ovum contains roughly 6,500 chunks of paternal and maternal DNA, about 4,800 centimorgans. In other words, the chunks in the ovum are a little bit bigger than in the sperm, even though they have about the same total DNA length. Because of the randomness of DNA chunks, the amount of genetic material we inherit from each grandparent is not exactly 25%. 
Remember, from our parents, it is exactly 50%, with the exception of the minor caveats I mentioned, why chromosome and mitochondrial DNA. Mathematically speaking, we may inherit anywhere from 0 to 50% of our DNA from any particular grandparent, with an average of 25%. Statistically speaking, however, because of the relatively large number of DNA chunks involved, the amount of DNA inherited from any particular grandparent rarely strays outside the 15 to 35% range, as you can see here. This information, although somewhat tedious, is useful in determining how far to push back in time and generations the construction of our family tree. Remember that with each passing generation, and three generations per century is a useful rule of thumb when we average men and women, our number of ancestors normally doubles. From four grandparents to eight great-grandparents to 16 great-great-grandparents and so on. If we, go, if we were to go back 17 generations ago to our ancestors at the time of the fall of Constantinople in 1453, we find that we would have up to 130,000 or so distinct ancestors who lived around that time. That number for any of us is likely slightly smaller, say between 100 and 120,000 because of intermarriages of distant relatives that we have undoubtedly sometimes occurred during the course of all those generations among people living at the same village or geographical region. Did all these people contribute to our unique genetic makeup? After all, each of those 100,000 plus ancestors could still average a contribution of 30,000 or so base pairs to our DNA given how big the total number of base pairs is. So to what lengths should we go in terms of trying to reconstruct our genealogical pedigree? The answer is less overwhelming. Since the paternal and maternal DNA is inherited in chunks of the order of several hundreds of thousands of base pairs, within a few generations, typically when one goes back seven generations or more, certain ancestors begin to fall off from the tree in the sense that none of their DNA made it to us, none. We can say with certainty that all our ancestors up to at least six generations or two centuries ago, in other words, are up to 64 great, 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 great grandparents positively contributed to our genetic makeup. But if we go back many more generations, then some of those ancestors, we don't know which ones, are irrelevant. They did not contribute anything to us. If we do the math in reverse, which you see on the right-hand side, it turns out that the total number of distinct people who contributed genetically to each one of us from any distant generation is on the order of 700 people to a couple of thousand. That's all. Not the 100,000 plus from the Constantinos Paleologos generation, not everyone under the sun, from the Alexander the Great generation, whatever the uh, my big fat Greek wedding scenario would want would want you to believe. So going back six or seven generations is a methodical in a methodical genealogy exploration makes sense. Going any further back is not genetically speaking worth it. There are two exceptions. Two of our ancestors from any generation, however distant are unique, can, but can be identified in principle, and we know with certainty that, in the case of men, contributed to our DNA. One is the purely patrilineal sequence of ancestors, the ones from whom we get our last name and with whom we always share the 57 million or so base pairs of our Y chromosome, uh, minus chance mutations, which average about two base pairs per generation on the Y chromosome. The other is the purely matrilineal sequence of ancestors with whom we always share the 16,569 base pairs minus chance mutations, which is typically less than 0.01 base pair per generation in each of the hundreds of mitochondria in every cell. These two unique genetic lines can be used to trace human migrations over tens of thousands of years, as you can see on these maps. 
because last names are in many cases patrilineal, one can sometimes go back several centuries in that line. Hebrew genealogies and Scottish clans are based on that principle. Alas, the same help is not available in the matrilineal line, presumably since in human societies there was generally no need to affirm the origin of a mother's offspring with a name. If we wanted to be genealogically and biologically correct, we ought to use the matrilineal last name alongside the patrilineal one, as opposed to using a mother's paternal last name, as they do here in Mexico, or a father's last name, as in the case of Orthodox countries and Greece. One final useful notion is the degree of relatedness with one's ancestors and relatives. That is equal to one degree between parents and children, and increases by one as you trace the genealogical tree to various relatives or ancestors. Grandparents and full siblings are second degree relatives, great grandparents and half siblings are third degree relatives and so on. With each added degree, the average amount of shared DNA drops in half. For direct ancestors, that starts with the parents, 50% almost exactly from each. While for living or side relatives, that starts with the full siblings, 50% on average from with each. The amount for siblings can theoretically vary between zero and 100% in the case of identical twins. For simple full siblings like myself and my sister Yuli that you can see here, it's likely somewhere between 45 and 55%. So, for example, uh, first cousins who are fourth degree relatives share 12.5% of their DNA on average, although the specific amount can theoretically vary between zero and 50%. The same 12.5% applies to each great-grandparent, that's what I have here, who are third-degree direct ancestors or three generations back. So from a particular great-grandparent, on average, you share 12.5%. It can be as high as 20 or 21%, it can be as low as 4 or 5%. A corollary in, of the reduction in half in genetic connection with each uh, uh, a, 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 um, added degree of relatedness is that the average number of living relatives roughly doubles. This point is important to remember when we do a genetic test, such as ancestry, DNA, MyHeritage, 23andMe, etc. These tests provide two pieces of personal information. The approximate proportion of our DNA that is associated with people who live in certain geographical regions, and the degree of shared DNA in centimorgans with other individuals who are in the testing company's database and may thus qualify as distant relatives. Uh, this information is typically provided for people who may qualify as up to eight cousins. This would be like an 18th degree relative with whom we share only six centimorgans on average. From what I explained a moment ago, a rough rule of thumb would be that our total number of relatives of that degree would be of the order of two to the 18th power. <laughs> Adding eight cousins and all closer living relatives, the total number for any one of us is likely upwards of half a million. I took uh, the test on ancestry DNA since it has the largest database of potential matches in the US more than 15 million of matches as of latest of potential matches as of latest count in other words upwards of 5% of the us population is in their database about 5000 of those records appear as distant relatives of mine okay so that gives you a sense uh, more of that in a minute so a dna test is a useful genealogical tool and it can reveal all sorts of surprises a good friend of mine recently discovered, after more than half a century, that two of her childhood neighborhood neighbor friends turned out to be her half-siblings, legacy of her since-departed father. However, a DNA test is not the key to developing one's family tree. For that, one needs all sorts of other resources and a dose of serendipity. Discussions with older relatives, ideally recorded and triangulated so the information can be confirmed or explained. 
publicly available records and archives, including birth, death, marriage, baptismal, travel, and census data, all documents and mementos, such as letters, photos, wedding invitations, diaries, and books. One significant help, especially for those from a small part of the world, like Greece, is last names. In Greece, we have been fortunate to have diverse and sometimes rare last names, plus the fact that most of our last names have been invented in the last few generations. A rare last name in the tree is a boon because finding others with that last name, for example, from the website I have there at the bottom, Apopukratai Skufiasu, uh, is, is, is really usually guarantees that they will be distant relatives. It is very important to keep a dated diary of entries in which interviews and findings get promptly written. You don't wait for a few months to write them up and summarize. More important than anything in this search, however, are two human qualities in the researcher. An open mind willing to logically challenge long-held assumptions, especially since skeletons will eventually start to fall out as closets are opened, and patience, since answers will take years, sometimes decades, before they become apparent. Time now to get personal. My quest began as a strong desire to understand whether the lives of my immediate ancestors impacted my own life and choices. It was for many years a source of curiosity how much I knew or thought I knew about my grandparents and how little I knew, if anything, about their parents, my great-grandparents. Closer to home, I had always been able to trace many elements of my father's and my mother's personalities and characteristics in myself, but I had questions. Why did my parents make the life choices they did, some of which had been extremely painful to me? Where did their characteristics and actions come from? Does history repeat itself? Can I trace those patterns back in generations and learn from them? How might my ancestors' stories cast a light or shadow to my story? For clarity, I will use maiden names for all women. My parents were very different from one another. My father, Tassos Kalamaridis, 1936 to 2009, came from a Greek family that lived in Alexandria, Egypt, until the nationalizations of foreign-owned enterprises by nationalist Egyptian leader Gamal Abdel Nasser forced them to emigrate from Egypt to various parts of the globe in the late 50s. His parents, my namesake Alexandros Kalamaridis, and who had been a cotton merchant in the Nile Delta, and his wife, Georgia Karnavura, a homemaker, settled in Athens. Hello. My father, the youngest son, had enjoyed a carefree, affluent upbringing in Alexandria before the move to Athens. An elegant individual with an encyclopedic memory, a gift for languages, intelligence, and wit, his career prospects were very good, even though he did not care to use his, his gifts and social advantages to further his position. A restless soul, he got coveted jobs in telecom, insurance, shipping, aviation, electronics, hospitality, photography, even computer programming in the days when this was quite uncommon, but didn't stay long in any of them. Eventually, he left Greece and his wife and two little children, me and my slightly younger sister, and lived for many years in various parts of Europe, such as London and Monaco, and in the Middle East, as we say in Greek, he was a bit of polytechnitis kerimospitis, or jack of all trades. My mother, Evgenia Papadaki, came from a village family from Rethymnon, Crete. Her parents were Georgios Papadakis, a police officer, and his wife, Erofili Papadaki. Erofili was a beloved and respected school teacher and war hero at their lovely mountain village of Spili, a street of which today 
bears her name. The family moved to Athens with a wave of Greek urbanization in the early 50s to enhance the education and career opportunities of their children. My mother, the eldest daughter, a very beautiful woman, inherited a mind oriented to logic, mathematics, analysis, and the big picture. The first female graduate with an electronics engineering degree in Greece, she spent her working years with the Greek Telecom, from which, from where she retired, a vice president in the late 80s. After our father left us in the late 60s, she was the one who stood tall under the circumstances and raised my sister and me impeccably. The very different attitudes and behaviors of my parents generated over the years all sorts of question marks in my soul, which were a large part of the impetus for my genealogical search for the truth. You can see here the genealogical tree, which has the four grandparents. What we will do now is embark on an adventure in each of the four branches. Due to the family circumstances, I grew up very close to my mother and grandmother Erofili. My grandmother was a true family matriarch. She fostered the creation of a family apartment building, Polikatikia, at the suburb of Nea Smyrni in Athens, so that she would have all her children and grandchildren around her for as long as she lived. She did so without ever coercing anyone. An educated and compassionate woman, she had a seldom seen today charisma, a gift for listening. This made her an ideal friend and confidant, a confessor and psychoanalyst for all of us. She valued friendships enormously and always taught me stories and examples of friendship from ancient Greece and beyond, while helping with primary school homework around the Mangali on winter days at home in Athens. My grandmother's affinity for friendships stemmed in part from her own upbringing. Erofili was born and raised at Anomeros, a proud and mountainous village in Rethymnon's remote Amari Valley in Crete. You can see it on the map. The word Amari from Italian Amaro or bitter evokes that other remote outcrop of the mountains of Crete, Sfakia, from Sfaka, the bitter oleanders that grow in the arid gorges. Back to my grandmother, she was the fruit of a teenage love affair between my great-grandfather, Antonios Mavroyanakis, and great-grandmother, Anna Linoxilaki. Antonios was a farmer from the nearby small village of Agios Ioannis. In time-honored Cretan fashion, he abducted the willing young Anna and married her. The love affair did not last. Her parents divorced while Erofili was still a baby, and they separately then left to seek their fortunes in America, leaving the little girl at Anomeros with her maternal grandparents, Antonios, Antonis Linoxilakis, you can see them at the picture on the bottom right-hand side, who was the village baker and had spent part of his youth as a laborer in late 19th century America, and Athena Michalaki. My great-grandfather, Antonios, or Tony Mavros, headed for Sioux City, Iowa, where some of his siblings had settled, and spent the rest of his life there working for the railways and playing the Cretan Lyra in the evenings. He never visited Crete again, although he always sent money to his sole daughter and her family. My great-grandmother, Anna, spent her life in Manhattan and married a Greek-American restaurant owner from Asia Minor, Ted Skouros. I eventually visited her tomb at the Cypress Hill Cemetery on Long Island at the border between Queens and Brooklyn. I found the Ellis Island records of both my great-grandparents' arrivals in America in 1912 and 1916 on the Ellis Island Foundation website with exquisite details of the boats they took to America, who met them upon arrival, what were their destinations in the U.S., and what were their first addresses in this country. Many people from the Amari Valley of Crete 
emigrated to America in the great wave of European immigration in the 1910s, so that today, whenever I check out the hundreds of thousands or the hundreds or thousands of my distant relatives on the ancestry, ancestry DNA website, a disproportionate number have last names typical of the Amari Valley. One of the top entries in my ancestry DNA distant relatives list is a Sacramento lawyer by the name of Ari Zikas. I sent him a message to see if we could figure out how we might be related and hit the jackpot. His father, Georgios Zizikas, turned out to be a hundred year old second cousin of my grandmother, Erofili, a Nazi resistance hero who emigrated to America at the height of Greece's civil war in the 1940s, became a successful real estate agent in California and was president of the Pancretan Association of America for a number of years. I could not resist the temptation to go visit them with my mom on one of her sojourns with me in America, and we did so shortly before his 100th birthday in 2018. It turned out that he had lived in Manhattan at my great-grandmother's place upon his arrival in America for 18 months, and he had researched family genealogy extensively. So I learned from him that the family last name Linoxilakis originated five generations ago from a great, great, great grandfather, Michalis Portalios, from an old Venetian family of Rethymno, who was quite irascible. So he was likened to thin, ready to ignite wood, Linoxilo in Greek. I also ascertained my relatedness to Kostas Linoxilakis, a famous footballer with Panathinaikos in the 50s and early 60s. Back in Crete, my grandmother grew up at the village of Anomeros with grandparents, uncles, and cousins, but without parents or siblings. She was always well cared for thanks to the remittances from her father. An artistic soul, she took up oil painting, learning French, playing the mandolin, and collecting 78 RPM records for her Victrola. But her longing for more than an extended family was, I believe, what made her seek out and form a number of lifelong friendships. Spili, at the neighboring Ayos Vasilios Valley of Rethymnon, and the place I identify as my family village, was the village of Erofili's husband, my grandfather, Georgios Papadakis, whom she married in 1933. A soft-spoken, avid reader who combined cleverness with wisdom due to his life experiences, my grandfather was a military man. As a youth, he joined Greece's expedition to Asia Minor with the Order of Cretan Gendarmes, Tagma Criton Horophilakon, leaving behind his parents, Nikolaos Papadakis and Evgenia Pavlaki, who passed away at Spili in his absence, victims of the Spanish flu pandemic in early 1919. My grandfather, who fought at the Sangarios River, River battle and elsewhere, was captured by the Turks in Asia Minor and spent a year and a half in Turkish prisons before eventually returning to Spili in 1924. Recipient of a, med of a special medal for bravery, he did suffer from lifelong PTSD, which expressed itself in agonizing nightmares. He never talked about these indelible experiences to the family experiences that I had to deduce from my readings of others of his generation, especially the books of celebrated novelist Elias Venezis. When the Nazis occupied Crete in 1941, he resigned his police post so as to not serve under the Germans, and he did not rejoin after the war so as to not take sides in the civil war that ensued. My grandmother's mother, my grandfather's mother, Evgenia Pavlaki, came from a nearby historic village, Argyrupolis, which underwent lots of telling name changes in its long history. The water-rich site was one of the most important cities in, of Crete in Roman and early Christian times, 
Lapa. The Byzantines changed it to Argyrupolis, Silver City, or Stimbolin, just like the colloquial name for Constantinople, which later the Turks adopted as Istanbul. The place eventually faded in importance, and in Ottoman times, it came to be called Gaiduropolis, the town of donkeys, since the plentiful water made it an obligatory donkey stop. In 1878, the proud villagers restored its original Byzantine name. Back at Spili, my grandfather's pandemic victim father, Nikolaos, came from a line of priests, hence the last name Papadakis, and our family tradition of always sitting at the front row at the village church. Talking with older relatives at Spili many years ago, I discovered that his grandfather, Angelis Vlatakis, was one of the celebrated four martyrs of Rethymnon, a group of four brothers and cousins from the village of Belampes, overlooking the Libyan Sea, who were tortured and executed by the Turks in 1824 as instigators of the unsuccessful 1821 Greek revolution against the Turks in their part of the island. Their story is especially significant since they had been forced to become crypto-Christians. Muslims, for all external purposes, they had changed their last name to Redzepis, just like the name of the ruler of Turkey today. And they simply proclaimed their Christianity and fought the Ottomans when the 1821 Greek Revolution broke out. Their execution by the Ottoman authorities was a big and sensational affair in Crete at the time and it was duly accompanied by reports of a number of minor miracles, which led the Orthodox Church to canonize them shortly afterwards, and to build a large church next to the sycamore tree where they were hanged at the town of Rethymnon. Angelis's son, my great-great-grandfather Georgios, decided to move from the village of Melampes to Spili, where he became a priest, just like his martyred father. Unlike his canonized father, however, this enterprising and perhaps slightly rebellious ancestor practiced black magic on the side, a practice which over time gave him a lot of power over the superstitious at the time Christian and Muslim communities of Spili. The devil priest, of Yaolopapas, as they called him, used this power so as to acquire all the best farming lands around Spili, which he then bequeathed to his three sons and eight daughters, who were, of course, the source of the quasi-infinite number of third cousins that I meet every summer for Raki at the cafes of the village. These lands were also the reason why I know practically of no emigrants to America or elsewhere from my grandfather's branch of the family. They did not have the economic incentive to emigrate. As a young woman at Anomeros in the 1920s, my friendship-oriented grandmother, Erofili, partook of the social media of the time. The equivalent of Facebook in those days was pen pals or Fili di Alilografias. This program, which is an overlooked element of the integration of young Asian, uh, Asian minor refugees with their counterparts from mainland Greece, matched young people with similar interests so as to develop friendships via the exchange of letters. One of the lifelong friends my grandmother Erofili acquired through this program was an Alexandrian born and raised Greek girl my paternal grandmother, Georgia Carnavura. Their common interest? They both traced part of their ancestry at the village of Anomeros in Crete, where Erofili lived before her marriage. Georgia's mother, Marika, lived at Anomeros with her husband, whose last name was Kaparos, and their two little daughters, Cleoniki and Asimina my paternal grandmother's older sisters. I tried for many years to determine my great-grandmother Marika's last name. So when I came across the 100-year-old Sacramento uncle who hailed from the same village, I asked him. 
he didn't know, but he immediately gave me the name of a village elder at Anomeros who had the best memory and records and would surely help me. Armed with that information, I arrived at Anomeros one bright morning in late August 2018 during my annual sojourn on Crete and started asking around for that village elder, only to be met by puzzled stares. Eventually, one of the men at the Cafe Nio approached to let me know, sotto voce, that the man I was looking for had just been murdered a few weeks earlier, a vendetta retribution for a crime he had committed a decade before. Nobody, of course, was arrested for the crime, even though everyone knew who the two perpetrators were. Such are the wayward ways of Crete, even today, which resulted in my reaching a dead end in the quest for the family name of that great-grandmother. In the early 1900s, great-grandmother Marika apparently became a widow. She eventually met a young merchant from the town of Rethimnon, Kostas Karnavouras, remarried and moved with the girls and her husband to Alexandria, Egypt, where Kostas set up a small trading business in African goods, and where their daughter, my paternal grandmother, Georgia, was born. I puzzled for the longest time over the last name of my great-grandfather, Carnavuras, a very rare last name at Rethimnon, or anywhere else for that matter, only to realize the simplicity of the answer quite recently when I was reading about the origin of the word Agleoras, omnivore. It turns out that this word comes from the ancient Greek Elevoras, it immediately dawned on me that the last name Carnavuras was simply the Hellenized corruption of the Italian word Carnivoro, no doubt a nickname given to an ancestor in Crete during Venetian times, and possibly the reason of my unavowed thrill for a good steak. The family story goes that my great-grandfather Costas used to travel along the Nile so as to bring goods to trade to Alexandria, and on one of his trips, he was lost, never to return, presumably eaten by the lions. A few years ago, on a sailing outing with friends in the Saronic Gulf of Athens, one of my companions turned out to be Mortada, a young aristocratic Greco-Sudanese who had grown up in the Sudan and was serving with the Greek embassy in Qatar. I decided to tell him the story of my great-grandfather to see if he could perhaps offer some ideas or likely details as to his demise. Upon hearing the story, Mortada began laughing loudly and uncontrollably. I've heard lots of stories like that lots of times before, he told me when the laughter subsided. Your great-grandfather almost certainly was not killed by wild animals in the Sudan or elsewhere in Africa. There were many cases of Greeks from Egypt who got tired of their wives and family chores and simply went to the Sudan, hooked up with local black girls and lived a carefree life. And to make his point more emphatic, he decided to test my geographic knowledge. Do you know what is the name of the third largest city of Sudan? Outside of Khartoum and Port Sudan, I did not know of any other Sudanese cities, so I relented. Well, it is Kosti, he said. It is located on the west bank of the White Nile, several hundreds of kilometers to the south of Khartoum. Do you know why it is named Kosti? Because it was founded in the late 19th century by a Greek guy named Kostis and his Sudanese wife, and was settled by the various Sudanese who followed them to that location. Of course, my great-grandfather was not Kostis Murikis, the founder of Sudan's Kosti. Still, Mortada's story made sense. Kostas Carnavuras, a small-time merchant who likely had trouble making ends meet, was saddled with a wife and three daughters, two of whom were not even his biologically, an onerous issue in those days of dowries, and he had badly wanted a son who never materialized, since two younger baby boys of the family 
were stillborn, as I found out. So his wife, Marika, and the three girls came into serious economic hardship in Alexandria. Marika decided that the best course of action would be to marry her daughters off to well-off Greek Alexandrian merchants, which is what happened. My paternal grandmother was married as a teenager with a gentleman by the last name of Moraitidis, with whom she had two kids in the 1920s. However, for reasons unknown, she ran away from the marriage and the two kids and ended up working as an ironing woman at the laundry when she met her second husband, my grandfather, Alexandros Kalamaridis. After 30 years of correspondence, my two grandmothers finally met face to face around 1956, when the Kalamaridis family visited Crete from Alexandria on a summer holiday. That's how my parents met. In a private moment, Georgia asked Erofili to see the correspondence they had exchanged over the years, which included a photo Georgia had sent of her first family. Upon finding the photo, Georgia promptly tore it into pieces, explaining to Erofili, We don't need to remember this. My grandmother, Erofili, told me that story on her deathbed in March of 1995. Until their passings, my father and his full brother swore that this story was fake and did not allow it to be discussed in their presence, an indicator of the pain this promitorico amartima, original sin, had caused everyone. My paternal grandfather, Alexandros Kalamaridis, arrived in Alexandria in 1923, a refugee from Smyrna at the age of 26. He had been born and raised in Smyrna at an affluent family who lived on the edge of the Aegean Sea at Karantina, a small seaside enclave three kilometers south of Smyrna's famous quay. His father, Emmanuel Kalamaridis, was a successful owner of three ships that carried dry goods between Smyrna and various ports of Greece. Because of its location, the family house in Smyrna was not destroyed when the city was burned down in September 1922. It was simply occupied by a Turkish family, although my great-grandfather and his son-in-law were brutally killed by the swords of the advancing Turkish irregulars soldiers, the infamous Tsetes, in the process. The rest of the family fled to Piraeus as refugees, except for my grandfather, the eldest son, who stayed in the house for several months, hidden in a secret basement with the consent of the family who occupied it, in hopes of salvaging the family property the way some of the Levantine families did. As it became clear that nothing would be saved, he traveled to the resort town of Chisme, from where he rode a boat across to the Greek island of Chios, and from there to Piraeus, where he reunited with the rest of the family. In Piraeus, the decision was made for the family to emigrate to Egypt, so as to rebuild their lives and avoid the misery of the rest of the Asia Minor refugees who had flooded Greece. In the same way, another Smyrniot, Aristotle Onassis, who was a classmate of my grandfather's youngest brother, moved to Argentina. In Alexandria, they indeed rebuilt their lives and their affluence, my grandfather as a cotton merchant, until they became refugees for a second time in the late 50s, as discussed. The Smyrna house stood, still stood in 1962, when my parents visited Smyrna and took pictures of it from the outside. However, when I visited in 1988, an apartment building similar to those of Athens had taken its place, a result of the urbanization and population growth of Turkey. Just like the vast majority of Greeks and other Europeans, the so-called Levantines, 
who had emigrated to Smyrna in the 19th century so as to partake in the trading opportunities afforded by the greatest port of the Ottoman Empire. My great-grandfather Emmanuel's family was not originally from Smyrna. We knew that they had gone to Smyrna after a sojourn in Piraeus, but not what their origins were. The last name is so rare that I did not know of other Calamaridis in existence outside my immediate family and an intriguing geology professor in Chicago, Ruth Calamaridis, whom I had encountered in the Science Citation Index. Two years after my father's passing in 2011, Facebook came to the rescue in an unexpected way. On August 15, my cousin, Maria Calamaridu, received name day wishes on Facebook from a stranger, a certain George Calamaridis, who had mistaken her for one of his nieces. My cousin promptly directed him to me as the family historian, and I was thus able to piece together that part of the family history. Despite appearances to the contrary, the Calamaridis family, it turned out to my surprise, were as Cretan as my mother's side of the family. My great, great, great grandfather's last name was Calamarakis, and he was a shepherd at the village of Campanos, a mountainous and windswept spot at the Selino district south of Hania in western Crete in the 1820s. Apparently, this ancestor committed a crime. He most likely uh, uh, he most likely killed a high-ranking Ottoman officer, and so he had to flee with his family to escape harsh punishment. These events were quite common in Crete in the 18th and 19th centuries, and they led to waves of refugees from Crete to mainland Greece or the Greek islands. That's why Kritikos or Svakianos or Hanyotis are quite common last names in various parts of Greece. That was also the inspiration of the extremely moving romantic poem Kritikos by Greece's national poem, poet <coughs> Dionysios Solomos. Instead of leaving the island, however, my ancestor moved to an arid and barren corner of Crete, the Akrotiri Plateau near the town of Hania, and effected a simple identity change by modifying his last name from Kalamarakis to Kalamaridis. There, at the spot of two unused Venetian watchtowers, he created the family settlement, which he called Campani, presumably in honor of Campanos, the village of his origin. When I visited Campani, which boasts a primary school founded in 1849, it was quite a weird experience for me since the streets were all named after various Calamaridis. Making a living in that arid area was quite hard. So the family ended up scraping limestone from the rocks to create whitewash for homes and took on fishing at the nearby beaches of Calathas and Stavros, the latter of Zorba's dance cinematic fame. Today, an olive press and car repair shops have been added to the village economy. However, the Calamaridis family did have a potential saving grace. The newly independent state of Greece, which had recently expelled its Turkish populations, was looking to resettle various empty areas with ethnic Greeks from not yet liberated parts of Greece, such as Crete. For that reason, it granted property titles to various non-liberated Greeks it, did, it deemed worthy. And my ancestor, perhaps possibly because of his crime, <laughs> received the title for a large property in what was then a swamp near today's Karaiskaki Stadium in Piraeus. It appears that the original Calamaridis did not want to leave Crete and Campani. However, years later, when one of his sons, likely the most enterprising one, came of age, he gave that son the property title so that he could make his life in mainland Greece away from the poverty and misery of the family at Campani. Thus, the son did go to Piraeus, but it was too late. Several years had passed since the property title had been granted, 
The area was already being settled, and my ancestor had not brought a large number of Cretan refugees with him to settle. So, the property title was not honored. My great-great-grandfather was left with nothing, and so, rather than return in shame and as a burden to the poverty of the family, he went to where opportunity beckoned, that is, to Smyrna, where my great-grandfather, Emmanuel Calamaridis, was raised. In the decades that ensued, poverty had led other members of the family to emigrate from Kambani, mainly to America, where they arrived in two waves. The first one is in New York in the 1900s, and the second ones in Ohio in the 1920s. The first group included the brothers Stamatis and Sifis Calamaridis, who became the founders of the first Cretan Association in America, New York's Omonia, in the 1910s. At the time, Lower Manhattan did not have a Greek Orthodox church for Greek sailors or immigrants. For that reason, they organized the community so as to purchase a three-story tavern, which they converted to a church dedicated to St. Nicholas. That was the St. Nicholas Church between the Twin Towers that was destroyed on 9-11 and is now in the process of being relocated and rebuilt. Back in Smyrna, in the early 1890s, Emmanuel, my great-grandfather, fell in love with a local girl. I was informed that the girl, my great-grandmother, was English, Helen Goodman, and upon marrying, she became a devout Orthodox Christian. No one ever heard her utter a word in English. As the sole male descendant of her eldest son, various family documents from Smyrna came to, my, came to, me, to me, including my grandfather's baptismal certificate in which she appears as Eleni Theodoru. Even though Hellenization of names was typical at the time, this was still somewhat curious since a racial hierarchy of classes prevailed in Smyrniot society. Today's closest analog would be Malaysia's Kuala Lumpur. Levantines, British, French, and Dutch primarily were at the top, followed by Italians, Greeks, who constituted the majority, Armenians, Jews, and Turks. So if Eleni was British, a proud indicator of upward social mobility, why was her background so carefully hidden in official documents? An important piece of the puzzle has been physically with me ever since I was a few months old. I was circumcised like every other male descendant of Emmanuel Calamaridis, something unheard of in Orthodox Christian families in Greece, and ostensibly done in our family, I was told, for health reasons. All these unusual pieces, bits of information over the years made me reach the conclusion that this great grandmother might originally have been Jewish. I emailed an uncle in Paris in whose Egyptian household his grandmother, Eleni, had spent her last years to ask if he knew anything to that effect. His thundering reply, nous n'allons pas faire la publicité des juifs maintenant, n'est-ce pas? We're not going to advertise the Jews now, are we? Heightened my curiosity. In September of 2016, while in London on business and with a free morning to spare, I decided to head to the London Metropolitan Archives to look for answers. Covering the British populated parts of the empire since the late 18th century, the LMA is an incredible publicly available resource for genealogists. And I found that being on site at the LMA made all the difference in terms of guidance, speed, and efficiency. Within three hours, I had my answer. One and only one record precisely matched what I was looking for. My great-great-grandfather, Theodore Henry Goodman, born in October of 1849, was the third of six siblings of David and Louisa Goodman, a Jewish couple in the town of Pontypridd, Wales. His father, David Goodman, 
had fled Russian-occupied Poland for Britain in youth and became a watchmaker and jeweler in his new country. Theodore was a wayward son. Unlike his siblings, who stayed in place and followed on the steps of their parents, 22-year-old Theodore was listed in the 1871 census as a commissioned traveler, then disappeared from the records and from any transoceanic ship manifests, and reappeared a decade later in Adelaide, Australia, married to a local Presbyterian woman. I'm willing to bet that in the years of his disappearance, which coincide with my great-grandmother's birth, one of his travel commissions brought him to Smyrna, where he fell for a local Jewish girl, had a daughter, and then left for a better fortune, never to return to Smyrna. So my great-grandmother, British though she may have been in last name, was really an orphaned Jewish girl who was asked to convert to Christianity when she married. Due to the sanctity of matrilineal heritage of the Jewish faith, she likely made a deal with her husband's family. I will become an Orthodox Christian, but you will respect my Jewish heritage by circumcising our male descendants. Finally, it all made sense. The family history I presented you here has been greatly abridged. Lots of fascinating twists and turns of the story had to be omitted in the interest of time and clarity. My immediate ancestors' stories made me understand some of the choices they made, such as my grandfather Alexandros falling for a girl abandoned by her father, just like his mother had been abandoned. His wife, Georgia, being emboldened to leave an unhappy marriage after her head father, Costas, had left her before. My father leaving me and my sister since his beloved mother had done the same, and so on. I could also finally trace many of my own traits, from my love for travel and exploration to the desire to find and exploit the logic behind every magic trick. In many ways, I can now see how history repeats itself and how life, if you follow it through generations, will very much look like the six epic episodes from one of my favorite movies of all time, Cloud Atlas. And what about my geographical origins as deduced from ancestry DNA? The percentages keep shifting and actually quite widely as ancestry improved their databases and algorithms, but they largely make sense for a Cretan with a little European Jewish admixture. At present, I'm 54% associated with mainland Greece, likely sampled from the Peloponnese and Attica, 26% with Italy, mainly the Northern Italian heartland, which helped colonize Crete in Venetian times, 26%, uh, excuse me, 16% with Turkey and the Caucasus, the Byzantine repopulating of Crete after the Arabs and the later Ottoman conquest, and 2% each from the Middle East and Eastern Europe, the Jewish part. Don't be fooled, however. Regardless of what the percentages may say, I'm a proud Greek and Cretan through and through, with an occasional nod to the small Jewish side through my many Jewish friends. The journey, of course, continues. I still need to find and visit my distant relatives in Iowa, hook up with the large Kalamaridis clan in Connecticut, Alaska, and elsewhere, seek the Papadakis ancestors Necronomicon, check out my Y and mitochondrial DNA haplotypes, and why not trace any Sudanese second cousins in Africa. I hope my story has inspired you to go out and do the same whenever, wherever the exploration takes you. Thank you for your attention. Can you hear us? 
Yeah, now I can hear you, Anna. Um, <laughs> Bravo. About others. Alex, uh, we thank yeah. you yeah. for moving us to no end yeah. because uh -huh. your steps we followed and we also imagine what we could find based on our suspicions, yeah. right? On, uh, on our ancestors. But it takes uh, tremendous courage and bravery and to open up and tell us all of that. And yeah. we thank you. Yeah, we yeah. truly thank you. We do thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. It was a difficult decision, but I think oh one that, was, that, yeah. that has been worth it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. I have tears, yeah. okay? You, uh, you really oh, moved oh me. Yeah. Thank you. You did great. It feels great. Thanks. Well, yeah. thank, thank you all. What an amazing story. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. And you find amazing, amazing stories if you look for them. The key is to look for them, to be, and to be, in a sense, <laughs> develop enough bravery to face the answers as they come through. Yeah. Because very often you will see an answer in front of your eyes and you will not be willing to look at it yeah. and acknowledge it because yeah. it may be different from what you thought or it may not be quite as pleasant as yeah. you might have, have, yeah. have considered it to be. You know, we tend to sometimes make our ancestors to be a little bit more heroic than they are. And right. the point is that there are, you know, that there, there are heroic acts and there are heroes, but then there are, these are human beings who lived li just like us. Exactly. And the point and, and my experience with this is that you will know, you know, that you are coming to the truth when the whole story makes sense as something that mm -hmm. would have happened almost like today. The kind yeah. of things that you saw in Cloud Atlas, for example, those of you who have seen that movie. No, I haven't seen it. We will look at it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Alex, a simply wonderful presentation. Very valuable. Thank you so much. Yeah. Ah, John, great. Great that you could join. I would love to, to have an opportunity to meet you at some point, as well as, of course, to, to catch up with Ruth, with whom I we like have you. I'm many, right many years ago, I remember that we were supposed to meet at the airport in Chicago many years ago, and that then, in the end, for health reasons, had not materialized. Uh, Alex, I'm right here. I live in New Jersey now, and the health reasons was my husband who was dying at the time, I believe. Right. And um, you swore at that point we were not related, but this was a fantastic presentation, and the stamati that you mentioned in New York City is my grandfather's brother. There you go, exactly. They were the four Calamaridis brothers that came to America at uh, probably around 1899 or 1900, I want to, to say. Did you? I haven't looked them up on the, the Ellis Island uh, organization website. You may have, actually. John has. Okay, good. Yeah, but now you understand how everything kind of falls in place in a certain sense. I do. And I think I was happy to find out that I was correct back in the 1990s. And you swore, as I said, that we were not related. But here we are. <laughs> yep, exactly. Connected. Exactly. Exactly. Good. My, good, my good. son, Jamie, who you're acknowledging here, too, would love to meet you, I'm sure. And... Uh, uh, find out more about what we have in common. Exactly, exactly. And I would love to do that. We'd look forward to it, Alex. Yes, we would. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, well, everyone, thank you. Thank you all for, for being here with us and uh, doing this. And uh, so, well, I will say goodbye at this point. Until till the next uh, till the next event of our society bye everyone bye bye alex bye alex bye alex thank you bye thank you alex bye bye maria goodbye bye. mama oh, good to see you right? yeah, yeah. Very proud. Who, who all were there <laughs> i'm proud i'm your cousin i'm very proud yeah yeah yeah, yeah. good is trepan <laughs> Again, congratulations, Alexandre, as always. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandre. <laughs>
<laughs> Bye, Dimitri, <laughs> Katerina. Have a great rest of the day over there in Houston. You too. You too. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Γεια σου, Κατερίνα. Και εγώ, εγώ ευχαριστώ που μου δώσατε την ευκαιρία. Ευχαριστώ πολύ σε όλους και ιδιαίτερα στον Άλεξ α, και όπως είπε στο Επανεδίν. Στο Επανεδίν. <laughs> Περιμένω α, για την εφημερίδα. Really professional. Very interesting. Thank you, Alex. Ευχαριστούμε, Άλεξ. Mm -hmm. Γεια σας. Καλό βράδυ. Mm -hmm. Καλό βράδυ.